Welcome to the Friends of Dan Music Podcast. I'm Dan Miles. You may not have heard the name Lee Sklar before, but I'll bet you a million dollars you've heard his bass playing. Over the past four decades, he's recorded with a number of mainstream artists, including Neil Diamond, Ray Charles, Barbara Streisand, Bette Midler, Neil Sedaka, Paul Anka, Joe Cocker, Glenn Campbell, Diana Ross, and Cher. He's played on albums by America, Eric Carmen, Rita Coolidge, Art Garfunkel, Hall & Oates, Linda Ronstadt, Helen Reddy, Olivia Newton-John, Bonnie Raitt, Aaron Neville, Richard Marks, Andrew Gold, Donna Summer, Lisa Loeb, Rick Springfield, and Thomas Dolby. He's rocked out with Rod Stewart, Sammy Hagar, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. And he's gone country with Vince Gill, Merle Haggard, Clint Black, George Strait, Faith Hill, Dolly Parton, Reba McIntyre, and Winona Judd. He's also recorded with top songwriters like Leonard Cohen, Jimmy Webb, Jimmy Buffett, Carly Simon, Randy Newman, Arlo Guthrie, David Crosby, Stephen Stills, and Graham Nash, Van Dyke Parks, Don Henley, Warren Zevon, Chris Christopherson, Donovan, and Carol King. But he's probably best known for his work with James Taylor, Jackson Brown, Lyle Lovett, and Phil Collins. Before we get him on the phone, let's take a minute to listen to just a few of the many classic recordings he's played on. You feel like your love is lifting me higher than I've ever been lifted before. So keep it up, quench my desire, and I'll be. She got big red lips, she got big brown eyes, and she treats me right. It's a big surprise, she won't do anything as she said she would. She makes me feel good, she makes me feel good. How sweet. Joining me on the phone from Pasadena, California, is Lee Sklar. Welcome, Lee. Well, I'm happy to be here. Well, we're honored to have you. Um, right before I called you, I read a list of some of the artists you've worked with, so I think you should know we're already about 45 minutes into the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's been a good run, I'll say that. Yeah, and it was just a partial list. But seriously, after hearing that list, I couldn't help thinking about one guy who I think it's a real shame you never got a chance to work with, and that's Russ Kunkel. Yeah, I've always wanted to work with Russ, but every time I ask him if we can work together, he says, I'm busy that day. When was it? How many uh, songs do you think you've played on with him at this point? I know He's, You know, it, it's so hard to say. I met Russ, the first time I met Russ was, he was in a band called Things to Come, and I was in a band called Wolfgang in 1968. 
and and we met at some gig, and, uh, and then we hooked up in 1970 with James Taylor, and you know I've I've done God I can't even tell you how many records I've done with Russ over the years, and and we still work together pr- quite regularly. So, you know, 40 years into it, it's been a lot of stuff. I'm sure it's hundreds. I'm just wondering if you've hit a thousand, probably. Uh, well, I mean, during the course of of my career, I, I've I think I've worked on like around 2,500 albums or a little bit more. And and, I'm, and a huge chunk of those would have been with Russ. Yeah, you're sort of identified as a team, but as we'll discuss, you've worked with plenty of other drummers as well. Well, since you're so identified with the bass, it might surprise people to know that it wasn't your original instrument and you started out on the piano playing classical music. What led you to switch over to the bass? Well, it was one of these things where I was kind of like a, as a kid, I was sort of a classical snob. Uh, I started studying piano when I was going on five, and I was and only studied classical music, um, and was really good at it. I, I had a natural affinity for it. Um, but when I was twelve years old and entered junior high school, I walked in there and kind of looked at the teacher and said, "Ta-da! Here I am." And he looked at me and he said, "You know, we got fifty kids that play piano. We need a string bass player." He said, "If you're game, I, I'll." give you some rudiments and he pulled out an old blonde k uh upright and as soon as i pressed my body against it and plucked a note i kind of fell in love with it you know just that feeling that vibration running through me and uh and i never turned back i just really you know fell in love with bass at that point and just focused on that and spent all my time playing that and kind of the piano fell to the wayside so it sounds like it was originally his own self-interest but fortunately for both of you, it worked out that you really clicked with the instrument. Oh, absolutely. Um, my teacher's name was Ted Lynn, and uh, I really owe so much of my whole life to Ted. He was really an inspirational a teacher to be with and um, just a generally great guy and, and really knew how to nurture. There's a classical cellist named Terry King who's like one of the premier cellists in America, and he was also in the music department at, at my school. And uh, they, they nurtured some really fine musicians out of there. Now, were you still playing classical music originally on the bass? Uh, well, when I started, it, our repertoire was pretty much classical with a little bit of, like, it, it broke down about six months into my playing. There was also a little jazz uh, group within the school, and we made a record, which I actually still have, um, doing things like autumn leaves and stuff yeah. like that. Wow. It's cute. So as a child and a teenager, you were playing very adult music, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it's just my, my folks were very eclectic in what they listened to. And uh, I just, uh, there was always music in the house, but the, the major bulk of what they really enjoyed was classical. So I, I heard a lot of classical and kind of just gravitated towards that. I wasn't like a Elvis or, you know... Even even kind of Beach Boys, none of, none of that stuff really... I, it was okay, but it, it wasn't where my heart was. It really kind of wasn't until the Beatles hit that all of a sudden my head got completely spun around. Uh, I, it was like an exorcist moment. My <laughs> head was spinning and uh, changed my life. And when the Beatles came along, you were already playing the bass? Um, I was playing the bass at that point, but it made me think of the bass uh, maybe in, 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 a, in a more... In, in a more profound way, uh, I, I had only been playing upright at that point and realized at that point if I really wanted to play rock and roll and be in bands where I could be heard, I was going to have to get an electric bass. Mm-hmm. And uh, there used to be, uh, in Hollywood right now, there's a place called Stein on Vine, and it's a music store across the street from the Musicians Union. Uh, but when I was it, 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 when I was getting started, it, it, actually the shop was underneath in a little room underneath the Musicians Union, and my dad took me there, and I got a uh, St. George uh, amp and a, and a melody bass, and those were my first uh, electric instruments. And, uh, and once again, that was another epiphanal life changer, to suddenly be able to really be heard and not just sitting there bleeding on an upright trying to get above... <laughs> the electric guitar and drum. Right. You know, I bet that uh, February and March of 1964 was a great time to own a music store. <laughs> <laughs> it, was pre- it was pretty vital back then. I, you know, it's, uh, er- everybody was, had bands, everybody was playing, and uh, it, w- it was great. Uh, I-, I loved it. Well, also, Paul McCartney, I mean, a lot of people first heard of him 
the Ed Sullivan performance, something like All My Loving, he's singing lead and he's playing a, a walking bass line completely counter to what he's singing. You know, he's, he's a very, very talented player. Oh, he's amazing. I mean, guys like that uh, really blow my mind who really do have that independence of playing and singing. Uh, James Taylor's that way. I mean, James can play these incredibly intricate guitar parts, and yet his vocal parts have nothing to do with those. They're completely independent. Um, uh, and I just sit there kind of in awe of these people. I mean, you just go, it's really a gift. Well, yeah, in the case of James Taylor, since he's... Uh such a talented songwriter and has such a distinctive singing voice. I think his guitar playing, the high quality of his guitar playing, is often overlooked. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's one of the finest acoustic guitar players in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, when you first met James Taylor, was it before or after he'd gone to England and been signed to Apple Records? It was like just after by a hair. Um, I was in this band Wolfgang, and our... Uh, drummer had a very close friend named john fishbeck who owned crystal recording studio in yeah. los angeles and you know and he had done like stevie wonders records there and the songs uh, in the key of life was recorded there yeah and uh, john was amazing well john was very close friends with james so he would he came to our rehearsals to hang out and james came along with him and hung out and um i didn't think anything of it i thought that he we kind of noodled around together and stuff and it was pretty cool um, but I didn't think anything of it. Um, and then uh, James got an opportunity at that point uh, when Fire and Rain was going to be released to play at the Troubadour in L.A., and um, he remembered me and had Peter Asher, who was, who was producing and managing him, uh, contact me and ask if I wanted to do it, and Russ was doing it, and that's how I met Danny Korchmar, and the uh, the whole thing came together at that point with Carol King playing piano and... Uh, it was one of those things that was so not thought about, yet it turned out to be one of the greatest moments of my whole life. Oh, you could pinpoint that moment. I mean, if, if he just casually thinks of a different bass player who doesn't remember you, like your whole life is different. I mean, you're so talented, you would have still had a great career, but that was really so pivotal. It was a pivotal moment, and actually at that time in my life, I was considering possibly becoming either a medical illustrator or an oceanographer. I had other interests in my life, so I... I didn't really ever think music would end up being... I thought it would be more of a avocation than a vocation. So I was never quite sure where I was going at that point. And, and that sort of just snapped my head around and said, no, go in this direction, and I uh, haven't looked back yet. It's all about the fire and the rain. Yeah, exactly. Well, you played on uh, so many hits for him. There's one I want to play right now. This track has a really playful quality to it. It sounds like you all had a really great time recording it. There are certainly plenty of tasty bass fills throughout. Uh, this is from the 1977 JT album, and it's called Your Smiling Face. Whenever I see your smiling face, I have to smile myself because I love you. Give me that pretty little pout It turns me inside out There's something about you, baby I don't know Isn't it amazing a man like me Can feel this way Tell me how much longer It will grow stronger every day Long before I met you Now I'm sure that I won't forget you And I thank my lucky stars That you are who you are And not just another lovely lady Sent down to break my heart Isn't it amazing a man like me Can feel this way Tell me how much longer It can grow stronger every day
Uh, when you show up for a session like that one, is there a part written out for you already, or do they expect you to create one on the spot? You create them. Uh, we're, we're on, on that album, I think we got together and, and rehearsed for a couple of days at Studio Instrument Rentals in Hollywood and, and worked up the stuff before we went into the studio. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's funny, on that one, uh, Yamaha came to Los Angeles in around 1971 with a bunch of prototype bases, to, uh, one-off bases that they were giving to... They gave me one, they gave uh, Abraham Laboriel one, all, all these different guys were given one to do product evaluation for them. They kind of wanted to see what we thought, and the base they gave me for that is the one I used on Smile and Face. Um, and it, was, uh, it was a terrific base. It had a few issues with it that I recommended they change, and I don't think they ever did, but, uh, but the base sounded great, and I, I used it on a bunch of our old section stuff, and uh, so... But that was a lot of fun. I, I loved uh, being in. I, I loved being in the studio with James, and especially in those days, the studio was really. It, it wasn't like looking at the clock every second. It was a real. Uh, it was a space for experimentation and 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 development. So uh, we really got to indulge the music in those days. Where nowadays you go in and kind of kind of looking at the clock and thinking about how much it's costing and this and that. Mm-hmm. We'd go in there and cut a thing and maybe a couple of days later go, why don't we go back at that one again now that we're in a groove with the, the project. And sometimes it would get a whole lot better. Sometimes our initial response was great. But uh, it, was, it was just a different time. Yeah, it seems like in the 70s a record label would stick with an artist even if they didn't have great sales initially. But now it's like you hit big or you're out the door kind of attitude. Well, it's, the thing was, I, I think one of the things I, I lament the loss of the most is artist development, because one of the people I always think about with that kind of stuff is Bonnie Raitt, because mm-hmm. Bonnie had so many albums before Nick of Time hit and put her really on the mainstream map. Up to that point, she was a real cult figure. Right. But the, the label stuck with her knowing that at some point she was going to go, and then the old catalog would, would more than pay for itself. And nowadays, I get called to work with people. Nobody has album deals. They got maybe an EP if they're lucky, or just a single. And if it doesn't do unbelievably great, because it can even do fairly great, and that's not enough. Yeah. Um, but if it doesn't do unbelievably great, they're history. They're, go- they're gone. But in the old days, I hate to say the old days, you know, <laughs> it's like, I guess the reality every time I pass a reflective surface, there were old days because I yeah. see myself now. It's, it's all relative. Time's all yeah, relative. I know. <laughs> um, but in those days, most of the labels, you know, I mean, when I would go in and I'd be working with Ahmed Erdogan and Jerry Wexler and Joe Smith, these guys were not as much businessmen as music people, right. Herb Alberts and the guys like that, their passion was music, and they knew that if you did great music, the business was going to be there. Um, but nowadays, a lot of the people involved in these things really are more corporate, and you know they're not. Their passion isn't so much the music as the business side of it. So it it, it takes on a different spin. Well, I'm I'm going to make a prediction that 50 or 100 or 200 years from now, uh, people are going to be a lot more interested in the music of Herb Alpert than a lot of the stuff that's being done, the disposable stuff that's being done right now. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yet, yet uh, on occasion, boy, I walk in the studio with some young artist, and they just completely blow me away, and mm-hmm. I just go, oh, this is great. Um, and and the, the talent's out there. It's really, at this point, we've just entered a time where it's, it's how do you get it out to people is really the difficult part, and how do you make a living at it right. with the advent of, of free downloading. Um, right. So it, it, that becomes an entire different uh, discussion at that but, point. But those, you know, talented people you're talking about, it seems like instead of having the music industry working with them, they seem to succeed in spite of the music industry. I, it, like I'll tell you, I've used that exact phrase. I always work, work with some of these artists, and I go, if you make it, you're going to make it in spite of the business. Yeah. Huh. It's sad. I mean, it's really sad. But um, I've, I've tried to guard myself over the years and, and really try not to turn into an old fart who sits there talking about, well, in my day, son, mm-hmm. you know, when I work with young artists, I'm not going to sit there and talk about analog vers- versus digital, mm-hmm. because most of these guys have never even seen an analog tape machine, let mm-hmm. alone recorded on one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's a moot point when there is no uh, reference. It's funny, though, how kids now have a nostalgia for uh, vinyl and turntables and things, you know. 
I it's great. Yeah, me too. It's yeah. it's funny. Well, um, there's one band on your resume that it might surprise people to know you recorded with, and that's The Doors. After Jim Morrison's death, the three surviving members recorded two more albums of original material. First was called Other Voices, and the second, which you played on, was Full Circle. I know it's, yeah. it's been a while, but do you remember what the mood was like at those sessions? You know, the guys were all, they, they just enjoyed music, you know, so it, it, was, it wasn't like they were sitting there. I, I didn't get the impression that, you know, it was, it was, there was nothing somber about it, the fact mm-hmm. that, that Morrison wasn't there. I mean, I'm sure they profoundly missed him because there he was, the, the, the signature uh, of the group. But the guys were all, you know, players, and they wanted to still continue on. I mean, that's the difficult part when you start looking at these things where members start to, you know, when John Bonham died, what do you do with Zeppelin at that point? Mm-hmm. You, you either pack it in or you move on and... I sit and look at the at the Who, and you think about losing Keith Moon and then John Entwistle and stuff. I mean, how at what point do you you pack it in as a group? And so it was difficult for those guys. Yeah. I think in terms of the identity of the Doors was you know the uh, was the uh, the Morrison the mystique, but they still had music in them that they wanted to express. So I was very I was thrilled to just get a chance to hang with the guys. I mean, I, I used to see them all the time, even when Morrison was alive. I mean, the, the Sunset Strip in Hollywood was, was a vital area through the um, 60s and into the 70s, and I saw tons of acts from Sons of Champlin and Canned Heat and Cream and, and um, Sly and the Family Stone. I was an usher at the Hollywood Bowl when the Beatles played there. Wow. You know, there was a vital music scene in town, so I remember seeing these groups. So when I would get called to work with some of them, for me, I was kind of going, wow, this is, <laughs> this is weird. I, uh, I was a fan of these guys, and suddenly I'm like sitting in the room with them, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and all those guys. I mean, mm-hmm. I, pinch, I still pinch myself to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at, at what's happened in my life. Yeah, and other people down the road feel the same way about you, probably, you know. They're thrilled to work with you, but and you probably never lose that, you know, your origins, that original sense. I mean, I'm a fan. You know, I just, I, I really, I feel so <laughs> blessed to have have been able to have a life in the music business, and and like any other business in any other aspect of life, there's ups and downs in it. But in general, boy, I would never complain for a second about mm-hmm. it, and and the relationships and friendships. I've been able to cultivate over the years with some of the greatest musicians on the planet just blows my mind. Well, in addition to the standard four-string, you're also fluent on five-string bass, acoustic string bass, fretless electric, and so on. So would you advise young bass players to try to master every incarnation of the bass, or do you think it's all right to specialize? Um, I, I, I think that certainly the more knowledge you have about what you do, the, the, the more desirable you're going to be. For me, I really had to do it because I ended up with a career as a studio musician, and as a studio musician, the demands on you change on a daily basis. So you have to be prepared for anything. Um, so, uh, you know, I might show up at a session, and and they're going to say, "Look, you know, we want you to use a five string on this one because we've got you know notes that are lower than your four string." So I go, "Fine." I'll play my four string, and then sometimes they'll say, well, "Could we do like a little soloy kind of thing in the middle, in the bridge, or something with a fretless?" The guys I know that are actually just band guys who are in a group, and that's pretty much what they do. A lot of them are are very the width or breadth of what they end up doing is a lot narrower because they're focused on it. Now they may have a bunch of instruments, but they're writing for themselves and crafting their own material, I've really got to kind of be prepared to do whatever gets thrown in my face. <laughs> so, so I have to have a bigger toolbox when I go to work, and, and I'm not a master of all of it, uh, and there's, there's times when I get called to do things um, that I'm not really comfortable with uh, in terms of, like, I'm not a, a, a slap-pop bass player at all. I just, I've had a lot of injuries to my hands and wrists, and I don't have the dexterity to do that well. I can fake it if I have to, but uh, the, the idea of faking something just really just cuts against my grain. So I have so many circles of friends that are uh, gifted in different areas that um, 
I'm confident enough that if somebody calls me to do a session and I know when I talk to them it's not up my alley, I'll tell them and I'll say, look, here's a couple of names of guys I think that would just mm. eat this stuff for breakfast and you'll love them. And uh, the way Jeff Picaro used to talk about Jim Keltner, I've done, I did a lot of records with Jeff Picaro and I've done a lot with Keltner too, more, more probably with Keltner. But Jeff would sit there and he was not self-deprecating, but he was one of these guys, he, he loved Keltner so much, he, we'd be on these dates and he'd go, look, Jimmy Lee would play this so much better than me, why don't you guys just call him and I'll just hang out. I mean, it was a real kind of trading around of gigs and stuff with guys. It was really neat. It was a real kind of uh, fluid atmosphere. Yeah, I've heard the stories about him doing that. And that just as an aside on the funk bass, I'm primarily a guitar player and a keyboard player, but I have a Yamaha bass, ironically. And I was getting a really good funky groove thing going one time, and I went to work later, and I realized I had like eight blisters all over my hands, and they were like these nasty, you know, I was like going, I'm done with funk bass. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. I remember doing a session uh, once with Lee Rittenauer, and he said, oh, let me check your bass out, and he started playing it like one minute into it he handed it back he said oh, this is horrible i can't do this because he's so used to just this light touch and all this and the bass you have to work your ass off on it you know yeah. it's, it's not it's not giving up much and i keep very high action since my training was on upright bass hmm. I, i'm not an ex-guitar player so my my action's very high so guys that play guitar that want to play bass this it's not their cup of tea at all yeah it's funny um i think one of the I wish I could have been there. I think one of the all-time great moments in rock was probably when Noel Redding was offered the chance to play bass in the Jimi Hendrix experience. And he, he said, what are you talking about? You're like, I'm a guitar player. I'm not going to play bass. And he heard Jimi Hendrix play. He goes, I'll play bass. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so Jimi mainly wanted him for his hairstyle. He thought he looked cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's another one of the guys I miss, too. Boy, yeah. Noel's, it, it, yeah. Noel's passing was very sad because he was, you know, somebody that, that I certainly looked at as, as a guy who was involved in something that was so profoundly pivotal in my life with, with, that, with that. And back in the late 60s, I would see them all the time. There used to be a club called The Experience on Sunset Boulevard, and everybody showed up there, and I'd be in there hanging out and trying to get you know, a chance to jam with different groups that, that were, were coming through town. Um, or just local guys, and suddenly there, Hendrix walks in the door, and he's hanging out, and he goes up and jams and stuff, and all these guys. So it was a it was an amazing scene. But Noel was uh, another one of those guys where you just kind of, I just dug him. I mm -hmm. thought he was great. 